Good morning. I really appreciate you all coming. It's a great honor for me to uh, introduce an, an old friend. Uh, I mean, a friend of many years. He's not old, but uh, he's, uh, he's uh, uh, genuinely uh, the, exactly the kind of person that we want to have uh, talking about issues at CSIS because he is a absolute true expert uh, on the situation that we're, we'll be discussing today, which is the uh, the Itlos case and the um, uh, that's before the the uh, court um, and and Paul Reichler uh, who has joined us today is is an expert I'll introduce him in a little bit more detail soon for those of you sitting back uh, please fill in at the table uh, we'd really uh, like to fill all these seats I think some say reserved but we can you're welcome to take these seats please um, it's nice to have everybody up at the table and for those of you who uh, started your day with a visit to CSIS's old building at 18th and K. Sorry about that. We're trying to reprogram everybody's head uh, that this is the, indeed the new building. Uh, and it's just a, it's a great pleasure to have all of you here today. Let me go straight to, uh, to the topic today uh, and introduce uh, Paul Reichler. He is a partner and co-chair of the International Litigation and Arbitration Department at a Boston-based uh, law firm called Foley Hoag. Paul has specialized in the representation of sovereign states and disputes with other states with foreign and, and with foreign investors for more than uh, a quarter of a century. He's part of a select group of lawyers with extensive experience in litigating on behalf of sovereign states before the International Court of Justice in The Hague and the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea in Hamburg. Um, among many other cases uh, and clients that Paul has uh, dealt with, he has particular experience representing and advising sovereign states in land and maritime boundary disputes with neighboring states. And these include Nicaragua against Colombia, uh, Bangladesh against Myanmar, and, uh, and several others uh, that he may uh, reference today. He served as a mediator. Uh, appointed by the Secretary General of the Organization of American States in Land and Maritime Boundary Disputes between Gu Guatemala and Belize. And I can tell you uh, firsthand, um, when I uh, was starting uh, um, actually my business uh, years ago, uh, we, we actually shared some space with Paul. And he is a, um, a brilliant uh, tactician, uh, a good lawyer, uh, a fantastic thinker, a very strategic person, and also just a, a wonderful, uh, a wonderful guy. So please join me in welcoming Paul Reichler, and 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 he'll ask you to take it away, Paul. Thank, thank you, thank you very much, Ernie. I I, I feel like I, I shouldn't say anything because there's no way I can live up to that. Uh, it, it is a great pleasure for me to be here uh, with you today, and it's an honor for me to have been chosen, along with my law firm, to represent the Republic of the Philippines in its uh, dispute with the People's Republic of China. Um, I uh, plan to speak for 20 minutes or so uh, to give you some background uh, on the issues, um, and the uh, reasons for the case that was brought by the Philippines, and then hold the balance of time for questions. So uh, I find that that's usually more interesting to the audience and more lively. And I uh, know that at CSIS, it's a very sophisticated crowd, so I'm sure there'll be some, some very interesting questions. Um, the the case is about this. Let me see if I can. What you see on the screen is uh, a depiction of the South China Sea. Um, and you see the, the red dashes uh, around the perimeter of the South China Sea. Um, to the north is China. To the east is the Philippines. To the west is Vietnam. And the southern rim uh, of the South China Sea is Malaysia, Brunei, 
Malaysia again, Indonesia, and then Malaysia again. Um, but I ask you to focus on the dashes. This is the so-called nine-dash line uh, that has um, aroused such interest and controversy. Uh, China first asserted this claim uh, in um, several years ago in a letter to the UN Secretary General um, opposing um, the um, submissions, a joint submission of Malaysia and Vietnam to the UN uh, Commission on the Limits for the Continental Shelf uh, seeking to establish extended continental shelf rights within the South China Sea. Uh, and from the moment that this letter surfaced in international discourse, it has uh, aroused a great deal of debate and discussion. Uh, what China claimed at the time in its letter to the UN Secretary General was that everything, land and sea, encompassed within the nine-dash line uh, is area over which China exercises sovereignty or sovereign rights. That area encompasses between 70 and 75 percent of the South China Sea. In the case of the Philippines, uh, you just welcome Ambassador Quisha of the Philippines. Um, in, um, uh, in the case of the Philippines, the nine dash line uh, comes within 50 miles, 50 nautical miles of the island of Busan to the north. You see it marked in black on the map. And it comes within 30 miles of the southern or southwestern uh, Philippine island of Palawan, right over here, just north of the Sulu Sea. Now, it, at its farthest extent, the Nine Dash Line is more than 800 miles from China's mainland coast. Uh, it extends between uh, 350 and 850 miles from China's mainland coast. And as I said, if this were a fence, it would fence the Philippines in within 50 miles or 30 miles of its coasts. Um, the Philippines' position is this. Under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, to which both the People's Republic of China and the Republic of, Philippine, of the Philippines are parties, um, a coastal state's entitlements are prescribed as a, an entitlement to a 12-mile territorial sea over which the, the coastal state is virtually sovereign. It's almost like land. And out to a 200-mile exclusive economic zone and continental shelf. And what that means is within 200 miles of its coast, a state has an exclusive entitlement to the resources, the living resources, the fish in the, in the water, and uh, the, uh, the non-living resources under the seabed. That's the continental shelf. Uh, the, whether it's hydrocarbons or some other minerals. The Law of the Sea Convention, which in this regard reflects customary international law. So even though, for example, there, there are a few states, we know which one is the main one, that are not parties to the Law of the Sea Convention, they are still bound by these principles because they have been adjudicated to reflect customary international law, uh, which is applicable to all states. Uh, but in this case, we're talking about two states that are parties to the convention. So there's an entitlement to exclusive use of the resources out to 200 miles. And as you can see, China's claim conflicts with this. By claiming sovereignty or sovereign rights, uh, not only more than 200, but more than 800 miles from its mainland coast, 
and within 200 miles, but not only that, within 50 or 30 miles of the Philippines' um, uh, coasts, uh, you have uh, China claiming entitlements which are not authorized under, under UNCLOS, under the convention, which overlap with the 200-mile entitlements of the Philippines, which are indeed authorized uh, under UNCLOS. The same could be said for Vietnam on the, on the opposite side. Um, now, um, so from the Philippines' perspective, and this is what the, uh, the main uh, claim in the arbitration is, that China's nine-dash line claim, that is its claim of sovereignty and sovereign rights, um, uh, extending far beyond its entitlements under the 1982 uh, United Nations Convention, uh, is inconsistent with that convention, unlawful, and it constitutes a, a trespass or a violation of the Philippines' rights uh, within 200 miles as set forth in the, in the convention. Now, this is not simply theoretical. Um, in fact, China has objected to and prevented the Philippines from enjoying its rights under the convention within its 200-mile exclusive economic zone and uh, continental shelf. Um, there is a, uh, a uh, an area called Reed Bank, which is uh, up around here, um, which is within 100 miles from the Philippines coast of Palawan, uh, which uh, reports uh, say uh, has uh, a major hydrocarbon potential. But the Philippines, until now, uh, has been unable to exploit this because of China's objections, indeed because of China's threats, that it will not allow the Philippines or a Philippines licensee to, uh, to exploit uh, that uh, potential resources. Similarly, China has um, prevented the Philippines from uh, exercising fishing rights throughout much of its 200 mile, 200 mile zone. So what, what the Philippines is seeking, first and foremost, in the arbitration, and I will come back uh, uh, in a few minutes to talk about the, the arbitration process. Paul, could you talk into the microphone? Oh, I'm this sorry. A pretty good online audience. Yeah. Sorry. So I, I will come back uh, in a few moments and really conclude my remarks by, uh, uh, without going into boring detail for you, uh, just outlining the basis, the legal basis of the arbitration under the convention and the process as it has developed to this point. But fundamentally what the Philippines seeks is a declaration that um, all of the rights and entitlements uh, in the South China Sea, including the rights to the resources, living and non-living, are governed by the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and that under that convention, the nine-dash line is inconsistent and unlawful. Uh, the Philippines is entitled to the full enjoyment of its 200-mile exclusive economic zone and continental shelf and the resources located therein, and that it should be free to uh, exploit, uh, without interference by China, those resources, especially where China has no corresponding entitlement. Now, uh, there are some other issues in the case which are, are worth uh, mentioning, and, and those concern the status of the insular features, islands and rocks uh, within the South China Sea. I'm going to see if I can operate this successfully. Uh, what we have circled here is uh, three um, insular groups, if you will, uh, in the, in the uh, South China Sea. To the northwest, uh, the Paracel Islands are not involved in the arbitration. They're in dispute between China 
and Vietnam, uh, but the Philippines does not claim rights in the sea extending that far. Uh, Scarborough Shoal, though, is a, a key element in the case. Let me see if I have a, if I can go right to the photo. Um, there it is. I think I have a better slide for that. Um, this is uh, Scarborough Shoal, or a piece of it. Um, Scarborough Shoal consists of six uh, features like this one, essentially rocks uh, that protrude above the water at high tide, barely above the water at high tide. This is the largest of the six uh, features. Now, um, sovereignty is disputed between the Philippines and China, but in uh, under the Law of the Sea Convention, an arbitral tribunal that is constituted does not have jurisdiction to determine sovereignty over land features, and that includes islands or insular formations. However, what the Philippines has uh, asked of the tribunal is that it determine the status of this feature under the convention. That is, is it a true island uh, which would generate, like a state with a, with a coastline, a 200-mile exclusive economic zone and continental shelf, or is it what the convention refers to as a rock, an insular feature that is above water at high tide, which is the definition of an island under the convention, but which uh, is so insignificant that it cannot sustain human habitation or economic life of its own. I don't think much more needs to be said about whether this feature can sustain human habitation or an economic life of its own. It's barely big enough to uh, support the Philippine flag. Um, now, what is the significance of this? Let's go back now. This is where I have difficulty in, uh, I might need some help going backward. Um, um, is Elka here? Um, in any event, I don't want to. We'll get you. Sir. Well, this is, fun. this is good enough. The, um, you can see Scarborough Shoal and where it is. Scarborough Shoal is about 120 miles off the coast of Luzon. So therefore, it is within the Philippines exclusive economic zone and continental shelf, which would extend another 80 miles beyond. You can see where that blue line is, that, where the blue area is. The blue area and the blue lines that surround it are the 200 mile lines from the different uh, coasts uh, uh, around the uh, 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 different coastlines of the, of the coastal states that border the, the South China Sea. So it's well within 200 miles of the Philippines. And if this feature is a rock entitled only to 12 miles, then what would be in dispute between uh, China and the Philippines would be a, um, a, a circle with a 24-mile diameter, um, uh, a 12-mile radius, 24-mile diameter, around Scarborough Shoal. And all of the waters not inside that circle would be part of the Philippines' exclusive economic zone and continental shelf. And all that would remain disputed would be the waters, the, the, the feature, and the waters within that circle. So for the Philippines, it is important to have this feature classified as a rock rather than an island because most of the surrounding waters then would be uh, subject to the exclusive entitlement of the Philippines and only a small uh, part of the sea would be subject to dispute, ultimately to be resolved whenever sovereignty over uh, Scarborough Shoal is determined. Now, um, in the, uh, I'm sorry, I want to go back again um, can you do it from there? To the, uh, let's go back again, one more, that's it. Um, these are uh, part of the islands in the Spratly group. Uh, Scarborough Shoal is not part of the Spratlys. The Spratlys is to the south 
of uh, Scarborough Shoal, and you can see very close, the, 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 the closest, uh, most of them are very close to um, Palawan, the Philippine, the, the Philippine island. Um, the, the Spratleys are about 140 different features. The vast majority of them are underwater at all times. Uh, another uh, significant portion of them are underwater uh, except um, uh, at low tide, and they are called low tide elevations. Uh, there are relatively few of them that constitute true islands in the sense that they are above water at high tide. And a, a very, very tiny number of those even have vegetation on them. Um, now, the, the Spratleys um, have been the subject of contention among a number of states. All of the Spratleys are claimed by China. All are claimed by Vietnam. Uh, a number of them are claimed by the Philippines, and some, a few are claimed by Malaysia and one or two by Brunei. Um, in uh, the third element of the Philippines' claim, that is, the focal point being first the nine dash line, second focal point being Scarborough Shoal, and third, the Spratleys. And here, similar to the um, uh, objective in regard to Scarborough Shoal, what the Philippines uh, is attempting to establish is that um, these features do not generate more than a 12-mile entitlement. That is, they are, under the terms of the convention, rocks. They do not uh, support human habitation or uh, economic life of their own. And uh, if, again, they have 12-mile entitlements because they are rocks, as opposed to 200-mile entitlements because they are islands capable of sustaining human life or human habitation or economic life, then their significance diminishes. And if they are all confined within 12-mile circles, then the reach of these islands or features does not extend very far. And again, this is a little more complicated than Scarborough Shoal. We're only dealing with one feature. But if these features generate no more than, than 12 miles, then the, there's a much larger area within 200 miles of the Philippines that is not uh, covered by any of these circles and that would uh, fall to the exclusive entitlement of the Philippines. Now, it, because there are so many features in this case, uh, and it might be too complicated to put them all before the arbitral tribunal. Uh, the Philippines has identified seven of them that are occupied by China and claimed by both the Philippines and China and asked the tribunal to rule on the status of each of those seven features. In fact, four of the seven features are underwater at all times. They're, 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 not only not islands, they're not low tide elevations, they are shallow reefs. As such, they are considered under the convention and under international law to be part of the seabed. And they belong to whichever state has rights over the continental shelf. They cannot be seized and occupied uh, by another state. You don't acquire title by occupation of an underwater feature. That's four of the features, including Mischief Reef, which I'll come to in a moment. And um, there are three features occupied by China in this area that uh, look very similar to Scarborough Shoal. They're quite obviously rocks. So the Philippines has asked the tribunal, in the case of all seven features occupied by China, to rule that, uh, well, in the case of the three features occupied by China that, that look like Scarborough Shoal and stick out above the water at high tide to rule that they have only 12-mile entitlements. And as to the four features that are permanently underwater, 
that these are not islands or rocks, and they generate no maritime entitlement. So the waters above them belong to who, whoever, is, whoever has the exclusive economic zone, and since they would be within 200 miles of the Philippines, they would, they would uh, appertain to the Philippines. Um, let me show you Mischief Reef, which is appropriately named. This is an underwater feature that's about 100 miles off, uh, well, what you see is more than the underwater feature here. But underneath this structure, which has been built on top of it, there is a reef that is permanently underwater. Um, this is about 100 miles off the coast of the Philippines and more than 600 miles from the mainland coast of China. In 1995, uh, China um, seized Mischief Reef, uh, even though under the law it is part of the continental shelf. As I said, it's not an island, it's part of the seabed and uh, well within the 200 mile uh, continental <coughs> shelf entitlement of the Philippines. Uh, this naturally caused a great deal of protest and uh, 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 led to uh, discussions between China and the ASEAN states. Um, uh, little by little, China began uh, constructing on top of Mischief Reef. This is only one of several sites at Mischief Reef, but what they have done is they've built a, a barracks so that they could um, station military personnel there, a, heli a helipad so that they can supply, resupply uh, uh, with helicopters, and uh, gun emplacements so that they could defend, uh, defend uh, Mischief Reef. Um, because of the great disparity in military power, the Philippines was able to do little more than protest and convene its neighbors and engage in uh, discussions, but the, the result has been uh, an expansion of the facility uh, by, by China. This is one of the features that is included in the arbitration. Since this is an underwater feature and a state cannot transform an underwater feature into an island by building on top of it, um, this, uh, this feature, the Philippines claims, uh, is part of the Philippines' uh, continental shelf and China is there illegally. Um, after the arbitration was filed in January, uh, China um, sent uh, a, a rather large flotilla uh, to another underwater feature about 30 miles to the east, also within 100 miles of Palawan, the Philippine island, um, called uh, um, Second Thomas Shoal or Iron Jin Shoal. And, uh, Although China has not yet constructed anything there, uh, they have uh, made public pronouncements that it is theirs, uh, and they have uh, told the Philippines that uh, no Philippine uh, fishermen may come, no Philippine naval vessels may come, essentially cordoned it off, um, again, expanding. I, I think uh, one of their generals referred to this in a in a magazine article as the cabbage strategy, um, but there, there is a, a risk of further expansion because there are many underwater shoals and reefs in this area, even closer to the Philippines, and of course a risk given China's behavior to this point, occupying and, and uh, fortifying Mischief Reef, now moving on to Second Thomas Shoal, um, that uh, there's no indication that they will stop, or if so, where. Now, um, the Philippines had spent uh, many years, uh, actually negotiations go back to uh, 1995, mainly bilateral, some multilateral. Uh, and uh, at no point uh, was any progress made in reaching any kind of a solution bilaterally. China simply held to the position that China has sovereignty and sovereign rights within the nine-dash line, and that includes sovereignty over all the insular features 
reefs, shoals, caves, rocks within the nine dash line. And um, uh, uh, there's no flexibility in that position in the negotiations. So the Philippines was faced with a, with a very difficult situation uh, that was getting worse. Uh, in April 2012, Chinese ships surrounded Scarborough Shoal and um, um, excluded Philippine fishing vessels. A uh, tentative agreement was reached that both sides would remove their vessels. Uh, the Philippines did remove its vessels. China did not remove its. And China remains in de facto possession of Scarborough Shoal. Uh, and then in um, the spring of this year, uh, China moved in on, on uh, Second Thomas Shoal to the south and part of the Spratleys. So the Philippines was faced with a very serious situation. One, it could not uh, exploit the resources uh, in the areas to which it has uh, entitlement under, the, under international law, including the UN Convention. Uh, two, um, negotiations had gotten nowhere, and there was no indication of any softening in China's position. In fact, all indications were the opposite after the incidents at Scarborough Shoal in 2012 and uh, uh, Ayunjin Shoal this year, or Second Thomas Shoal this year. Um, confronting China militarily was not a viable option. Uh, the Philippines doesn't have the kind of economic or commercial influence vis-a-vis -vis China to cause a change in its behavior, and uh, the options were limited. But the one option that appeared was the law, because uh, in a court or before an arbitral tribunal, a small uh, state that is weaker militarily, economically, commercially, has the opportunity, at least, to compete on equal terms with a much larger, more powerful state. And there are, uh, there's a growing number of precedents for this, particularly under the Law of the Sea Convention. Um, Guyana and Suriname in their arbitration, um, Mauritius and the UK in their arbitration, um, Bangladesh and Myanmar, um, and Bangladesh and India, which uh, I'm going over to The Hague to argue next week. Um, in all of these cases, we have smaller, less powerful states unable to uh, secure what they considered to be their rights under international law in negotiations with states that were more powerful or larger uh, militarily and, um, or economically or both. And the smaller state uh, resorted to arbitration under the Law of the Sea Convention. And that is what the, the Philippines did here. Um, now, um, just a, a couple of more words on this. Um, and I, I will, uh, this is uh, Article 286 of the uh, Convention. And it provides that, um, uh, just to interpret it a little bit for you, where a, uh, the parties have exchanged views on a dispute without uh, resolving it, then either one can uh, submit the dispute to third-party dispute resolution uh, under any of the mechanisms provided for in the Convention. And in the next article, Article 287, it provides that uh, they may take the dispute by agreement to the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea in Hamburg, which is what Bangladesh and Myanmar did, or to the International Court of Justice, or to um, uh, uh, a tribunal, an arbitral tribunal, that they would constitute by mutual agreement. But failing agreement to go to any of these forums, the fallback, the default mechanism, um, is paragraph 5 at the bottom. If the parties to a dispute have not accepted the same procedure for the settlement of the dispute, it may be submitted only to arbitration in accordance with Annex 7, unless the parties agree otherwise. So what this means is if uh, one party initiates a dispute 
under the Convention. The other party does not want to agree to any particular forum. That does not frustrate or stop the arbitration. The, part, the claimant state has the, the right to take it to arbitration under the rules specified in one of the annexes to the Convention. And the respondent state, the other state, is obligated to participate, is obligated uh, by that choice and is obligated by the decision of the arbitral tribunal, I should say. Um, let me see. I don't think there's anything else here that I want to go into right now. But so uh, under Annex 7, that is how uh, the arbitration was initiated under, under those procedures. Um, the way it works is this, the claimant state appoints an arbitrator. Uh, Bangladesh appointed a very distinguished uh, international jurist who's a judge on the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea from Germany, Judge Rudiger Wolfram. Um, and uh, then the other state has the right to appoint an arbitrator. And then the states try to agree on three neutral arbitrators, including the president. If they're unable to agree, the convention provides that those arbitrators will be appointed by the president of ITLOS, the president of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea in Hamburg. Uh, China took the position from the very beginning that they would not participate in the arbitration. So they did not appoint an arbitrator. And one was appointed. Uh, in lieu of their choice by the president of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. And then they refused to negotiate over the, the other three arbitrators who likewise were appointed by the president of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. We have a, a, an arbitral tribunal, and I, I've been before many, um, uh, that, is, that is clearly uh, one of the most esteemed expert a respected group of Law of the Sea experts that, that could possibly have been assembled. Um, it's provided over by Judge Thomas Mensa of Ghana, who was a president of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Um, it has uh, uh, Judge Wolfram, who I mentioned. It has Judge Jean-Pierre Jean -Pierre Cotte from France, another uh, esteemed uh, expert and, and judge on the ITLOS Tribunal. Um, the Polish judge, Judge Polak, uh, from the ITLUS Tribunal, um, is also a member appointed by the president of the ITLUS Tribunal. And um, the fifth member is a very, very distinguished uh, Dutch expert, Alfred Soons, who's the director of the Netherlands Institute for the Law of the Sea. So it's a, a very serious, very prominent, very expert uh, tribunal. Um, China still has refused to participate, but um, the Annex 7 provides in Article 9 that in the event one of the parties refuses to uh, participate, that does not frustrate or stop the arbitration. Uh, it proceeds. The members of the tribunal have a particular burden of establishing to their own satisfaction that the claims of the claimant state are supported by facts and law. Uh, they, sim they cannot simply enter a default judgment as might happen in a national court in the United States. Uh, so it's still a, a rigorous uh, procedure. Um, Article 11 uh, provides that the award, the judgment of the arbitral tribunal is final, it's not appealable, and it is binding, it's obligatory on all parties uh, as a matter of international law. To this point, the tribunal has met its established rules of procedure, and it has set a schedule which requires the Philippines uh, to submit its written pleading, what we call its memorial, its uh, arguments on the facts and the law and supporting documentation by the 30th of March uh, 2014. So the Philippine legal team is hard at work on that uh, uh, as we speak. Um, after that, the tribunal has reserved judgment as to what the next steps will be. It will give every opportunity for China to change its mind and participate. It'll keep the door open 
uh, for as long as possible. But ultimately, it will uh, proceed to consider the Philippines' claims, its evidence, and its legal arguments, and ultimately render a judgment. Um, and we expect that that judgment to be rendered um, uh, sometime in 2015, probably by the middle of 2015. It will be binding on the Philippines, and it will be binding on China. Um, whether China um, uh, adheres to it is an entirely different question, maybe one that some of you have comments about. But right now, our task is to uh, present the claims to the tribunal uh, and to um, obtain uh, the relief that the Philippines has, has requested. And, and with that, I will turn it back over okay. to Amy, who I'm sure will invite your questions. I will. Thank you, Paul. That was fantastic. And uh, I, I want to start with a question, but I, just to get everybody ready, if you have questions, please identify yourself and your affiliation and, uh, and, and ask the question. I'd like to start with a question of how, how would it be enforced? How would the judgment be enforced uh, if China disagrees with the, the judgment? And, and, and if it were awarded to the Philippines? Well, it's, it's of course, a very good question, and it's, it, it's not something that, that uh, is, um, uh, how can I say, unanticipated by the Philippines. Um, there, there's no, uh, there's no uh, posse, there's no police force, there's no sheriff. Uh, who might be ordered by a local judge to go and make the defendant uh, comply with, with the order. Um, it, is, um, uh, it is largely a question of whether a state that is subject to, an, to a, a judicial order or an arbitral award uh, chooses to comply or not. But having said that, I should point out, number one, that in 95% or more of cases decided by the International Court of Justice, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, or arbitral tribunals that have been convened for interstate disputes, in at least 95% of those cases, the states that are, quote unquote, the losing party, comply. Uh, we see this also in investor state arbitrations, although the compliant, compliance rate may be a little bit lower, but still in the vast majority of uh, investor state arbitrations under bilateral or multilateral investment treaties, which involve, may involve judgments of hundreds of millions of dollars, in the vast majority of these cases the states comply. Um, and the question is, if, if there's nobody who can force, if there's no army, there's no police there's, uh, that, who can force a state to comply, why did they do it in the vast majority of cases? And I think that part of it, uh, part of the explanation is that there is a heavy price to pay for a state that defies uh, an international court order or uh, a judgment of an arbitral tribunal that is seen, that is recognized in the international community as legitimate, as fair, as correct, as appropriate. Um, there's, a, there's a price to be paid for branding yourself as an international outlaw, as a state that doesn't respect, that doesn't comply with international law. Um, there is something to be said for soft power and for the um, ability, the, the, the component of soft power that is uh, composed of a state's ability to defend its actions as legal in the international system, as uh, explaining and defending itself as respectful of international norms. It, it's, uh, it becomes an important part of a state's ability to influence other states. Um, now, uh, it is important, therefore, uh, not only for the Philippines to obtain a judgment in its favor, but for that judgment to be seen as impeccable, 
in terms of its integrity, its honesty, its fairness, and, it, and its legal correctness. Um, it may be that it takes some time before China uh, uh, adopts a more flexible position. But it's not unreasonable to think, at least I would say, it's not unreasonable to think that in the ultimate resolution of this dispute or these disputes or parts of these disputes, the fact that the Philippines has a legal judgment in its favor that's recognized internationally as valid and binding and legitimate and correct uh, will play some role in the uh, evolutionary process toward a, uh, an acceptable uh, solution. Thank you. Uh, floor is open. Larry. <clears throat> I'm uh, Larry Nix from CSIS. Uh, a very interesting talk, Mr. Reichler. Uh, I have uh, two questions. First, on the definition of these uh, above water uh, objects or whatever you want to call them, you mentioned rocks and islands. Are, is this basically the only distinction under the law of the sea between rocks and islands, or are there other uh, classifications as well? Secondly, when this case is heard before the tribunal, uh, will other law of the sea country signatories be able to give testimony or submit briefs to the tribunal? I'm thinking especially of Japan uh, in this case. Um, the, in, in response to the first question, Article 121 of the Convention uh, defines an island. And, and an island is a naturally occurring feature that is at least part of which is above water at high tide. Um, Article 121, paragraph 3 says, uh, rocks um, which uh, uh, cannot sustain human habitation or economic life of their own are not entitled to an exclusive economic zone or a continental shelf. So the, the, the Article 121 distinguishes between uh, islands, uh, between different types of islands. Uh, if all, a rock meets the definition of an island if it's above water at high tide. But it doesn't get all the rights of an island, doesn't get all, generate all the maritime entitlements, that is, beyond 12 miles uh, of, of, a, of an island that is capable of supporting uh, human habitation or economic life. There are other features. I, I mentioned a low tide elevation, which is uh, a feature that is above water only at low tide. And there are features like reefs and shoals, which are mainly uh, below, sometimes they dry in patches, but mainly below water, even at, even at low tide. It's only an island or a landmass that generates a maritime entitlement. There's an old phrase, the land dominates the sea. What that means in, to those of us who work on this every day, it means that uh, a state's entitlement in, in, in the sea are gener is generated by its land, if it has a, its coast, so to speak. So if it, if it um, and an island is land. So islands generate maritime entitlements just as a large, uh, just as the U.S. Atlantic coast would, would, would generate it. But, um, and that includes a 200 mile entitlement in terms of continental shelf and exclusive economic zone. Uh, but features like rocks only generate 12 miles. Features that are not even islands at all have no maritime entitlement. And, and so there, uh, control over an underwater feature does not give you any rights in the sea. I didn't answer the other question, but I, I can, uh, can I do that? Yes, please. Uh, whether other states will be able to participate, uh, normally, um, it is uh, in arbitration. Uh, there, there is no opportunity for intervention. In, before an international court like ITLOS or the ICJ, 
uh, there is a right, well, there is a procedure for intervention by a third party. Of course, it's subject to the discretion of the court to allow it. And normally, there is no right to third party, third party intervention in arbitration. However, um, we, we raised this with the tribunal in the discussion of the rules of, of procedure in this case. And third party intervention was not precluded by the rules. So we interpret that to mean, in this case, that the tribunal would consider an application by a, a third state to either intervene or to submit its comments. And um, we, we know that there are a number of states in the region that, uh, that have coasts on the South China Sea that share the Philippines' concerns and indeed uh, have the same interpretations uh, of the convention as, as, as the Philippines and their participation would not be unwelcome. Hi, Mike McDevitt from CNA. Uh, to follow up on Larry's question about islands, uh, one of the things that I think many of us who've looked at the South China Sea are, are, have in mind is the issue of uh, many islands uh, that do not have natural water supplies but are occupied, like the Vietnamese around 22 and and everybody, everybody's squatting on pieces of rock around the South China Sea. Uh, has the law evolved in a way that would allow you to essentially go ahead and occupy, build a runway, put a desal plant on there, and essentially claim then that that can, in fact, support human habitation? Or are all of these people actually on fool's errands, uh, squatting on rocks that are, are or islands that aren't going to, in in the in the scheme of things, pay off? Well, it's a very good question, and it has inspired debate in the, uh, among academics who study this, uh, study this issue. Um, I, I think the, the uh, I should point out just as a fact that Vietnam has the same position as the Philippines in regard to uh, the none, that none of these features in the Spratleys, none of them is entitled to more than 12 miles. So they would, uh, at most, um, uh, be classified as rocks um, under the convention. Although there may be some difference of view between the Philippines and, and Vietnam over whether uh, certain low tide elevations uh, are rocks or not. But, but where the Philippines and, and Vietnam uh, coincide is that nothing in the Spratleys is entitled to more than 12 miles. But the question that you raise is a very good one. I, I think the answer uh, probably is, uh, I, wouldn't, I would not say that anybody is on a fool's errand. I wouldn't use that terminology. But, uh, but I, I think that um, there, there is a concept in international law, and particularly in regard to issues of sovereignty or status of features called the critical date. And, and once a dispute arises over the status of a feature, a, any state that um, unilaterally takes action to enhance its own claims after the dispute ha has arisen um, is not improving its legal position, let me put it that way. So I, I think here, uh, with the, all of the Spratleys being notoriously disputed, um, as a legal matter, um, these uh, artificial installations, whether you're talking about uh, uh, living facilities or desal plants, are not uh, enhancing the rights of any of the states. Okay. And we have a question here, and then this Thank you. My name is Paul Lewis. I work for The Guardian newspaper. Um, I was interested in the non-participation of China and wondered if you could speak to any uh, other examples where the arbitration tribunal has ruled in which one state has refused to participate and what the uh, consequences have been in terms of perceived legitimacy uh, of that state not participating. It, this, is, this is also a very good question. It happens very, very, very rarely. Um, and the, the, um, the case that comes immediately to mind is the, is the diplomatic hostages case, the United States against Iran um, in, the, in 1980, that um, uh, Iran did not appear uh, in that case. Uh, the ICJ went ahead and found that uh, uh, it had jurisdiction and that uh, Iran had violated 
um, uh, international conventions in its seizure and, and, uh, and imp imprisonment, if you will, of, of U.S. diplomatic and consular personnel. And uh, that uh, decision, that judgment by the court was widely recognized as legitimate. And, and indeed, it may have, uh, I, I, this is a question of personal opinion, so I, I can't uh, give you concrete proof, but I think uh, many who were involved at the time would say that the ICJ judgment did play a role in the ultimate um, uh, negotiation and an agreement which was brokered by the Algerians. Uh, there have been um, uh, a few other cases. There, there was another one involving Iran in the um, early 1950s, UK against Iran, the Anglo-American oil case. Uh, Iran did not appear initially. The court found it had prima facie jurisdiction, but then decided it did not have jurisdiction and vacated its, its earlier ruling. But these are, these are, of course, you have the Nicaragua against the United States. The United States did appear uh, both to oppose Nicaragua's request for provisional measures, and it did appear to uh, challenge the jurisdiction of the court. After the court, this is the ICJ, decided that it did have jurisdiction and proceeded to the merits, the United States did not appear for the merits of the case. Uh, the court, uh, uh, proceeded to enter a judgment, and while there may be some sectors in Washington that uh, continue to argue about it, uh, the rest of the world, and in fact, a lot of informed and academic opinion in the United States considers that judgment to be a landmark and a classic in, in international law. So there are very, very, very few examples of this because states do participate, but, it's always a danger to the system when a major state, uh, like the United States in 1984, but when a major state um, that, that especially, uh, well, a, a, a major power defies the international legal order. And what we have seen, I don't, I don't know if there is a connection or not, but um, an argument can be made that there is. Um, in, in really the very next case brought under the UN Convention after Philippines-China was Netherlands against, the, against Russia over the seizure of the Arctic sunrise and the holding of the, of the prisoners, of the crew as prisoners. And um, uh, the Netherlands it brought it as an arbitration, but under the convention you can seek provisional measures from the tribunal in Hamburg pending the establishment of the arbitral tribunal. And the Russians refused to appear. And I, I question, if, if China hadn't done this a few months earlier, would the Russians have wanted to be the first? And my answer to that is probably not. When Georgia sued Russia uh, over the 2008 invasion of Georgia under the uh, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Race Discrimination because of the ethnic cleansing that the Russians carried out, uh, Russia appeared. They opposed the request for provisional measures, which were issued by the court, they opposed jurisdiction, and they won. And uh, uh, I would have assumed they, would, they might have done the same thing here had it not been for China's example. Last question. Thank you very much. Mark Rosen from CNA. Um, what will be the precedential effect of this? Will there be a written opinion? My understanding is that arbitral tribunal decisions are sources of international law under the statute of the International Court of Justice. But I'd like your view on that. And then also, to the extent that you get a favorable ruling, would that be the legal basis for so-called provisional measures under the statute for the ITLOS to get something akin to a restraining order if China was to prevent the Philippines from developing resources within their EEZ? Also very good questions. Um, the, um, technically speaking, uh, an arbitral award is binding only between the parties to the case. However, um, these awards in interstate cases 
usually issued by very prestigious world-class experts, legal experts on the law of the sea, become published. And they are cited in other cases. Uh, the International Court of Justice, as you said, cites arbitral awards as well as its own decisions when it, when it issues opinions in, in support of its, of its judgments. Arbitral tribunals cite other arbitral tribunals. Um, and uh, especially if you have a tribunal with people like Mensa, Cott, Wolfram, Pollack, uh, Fred Soons, uh, one would expect a very, very well-reasoned opinion. One would expect that anyway from five arbitrators like that. You can be sure in a case like this, which is going to receive a lot of attention and a lot of scrutiny, they're going to be extremely careful to issue a, an award which is uh, very, very carefully and thoroughly justified. And I think it will be cited um, uh, frequently in, in other cases. It will be taken as a, as a statement, as an interpretation of the law. Um, it presents some novel questions, but some questions which are rather clear uh, or should be clearly answered under the very clear and expressed terms of the convention. Um, so I, I think it will have a, I, I think it will have a, a huge impact on the international legal community and hopefully on the international community in general and hopefully that will create the kind of environment which over time will, will permit China as it evolves to become more of a law cognizant country uh, to, to incorporate, to digest, and, and to find a way to accommodate. Um, when I say a, as its evolution toward a law cognizant country, there was a time nobody thought that China would ever comply with adverse WTO uh, awards. But it, it's doing that largely. So the, the, the world isn't static, China isn't static, and I, th there's reason to believe that uh, over time, and uh, with persistent di diplomacy and support from the international community, if an award is issued that favors the Philippines, it will have some impact. Now, as to going to ITLOS, um, uh, let me say, it, it's a very interesting idea. I, uh, for provisional measures, some sort of restraining order, um, it's not one that we have uh, had occasion to study yet, and I, and, uh, uh, for that reason, I would be hesitant to, to offer an opinion now without fully knowing what I'm talking about. But it's a very interesting idea. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Paul. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we would all agree, Paul, we're going to ask you to come back from time to time. Happy to do <laughs> I think we it. Just, now that I know where you are. You now we just started the... Uh, it would thing. have been very embarrassing here talking about the South China Sea if I couldn't even find Rhode Island <laughs> Avenue after, after going to 18th and K, but I made it. <laughs> Great job, Paul.